want to move on to a slightly more controversial area, which is sibling placements. There's a lot of <coughs> movement afoot amongst adoption agencies and amongst local authorities to try and keep siblings together and to place siblings together. Do you think it's possible, really, to developmentally reparent and to use pace when you have sibling groups of two or three or four even, where you have two or three or four highly traumatised children? Is it possible? Yes. Uh, what are the probability of it? Uh, how much risk are we willing to take here? Yeah. Uh, who are the parents? Who are the kids? How traumatized? What is the nature of their symptoms? The nature of their history? How much sort of health is embedded in the trauma? So there's many questions. My view is that certainly there's good reasons to keep siblings together. Yeah. In no way would I dismiss that. Uh, these kids hopefully will be together for the next 70 years. True. So there's value in siblings being together. Not though if they'll be together in 17 failed adoptions. Uh, if that happens, they'll be together in prison. Yeah. Now, I don't want to over, you know, cause fear here. I don't want to, yeah. But what I, I want to say is that children need parents. They need stability of a permanent home. That's the goal. Now, I want to integrate that with their siblings. I mean, the, yeah, I, I do want that. That's the idea. But we need... And it's hard work, but we need to assess each sibling group and say, can these kids, can healthy adoptive parents who get the support, the knowledge, the training that they need, successfully raise these three traumatized kids? Yeah. And then sometimes it may be yes, with this type of support, sometimes no. So then what am I saying? Well, I'm saying these siblings we should do everything we can that they have contact with each other if they can't live yeah, together. Definitely. So we put a lot of energy into the adoption of homes aren't on the other side of the country. They can actually have contact and visit yeah. and they see the value of it. That I think, to me, as siblings should have a right to contact yes. with their siblings unless it's strongly indicated against for whatever reason. Yeah. But we have to assume that they're going to have contact again unless there's a solid reason to stop it. But I don't think we should give them the right to live together. I think that's an individual decision we have to make in terms of what's the best interest, not just of one of the children, because sometimes say, well, it's probably best that he stay with his older brother. <laughs> but what if it's not best for his older brother? Yeah. We have to say, this is best for all of them. Yeah. And then, and sometimes it, it can be controversial because uh, good people may disagree on what's best, yes. but we have to then really work hard and not start with an assumption that it's best to stay together. No. Or to part. Or to part. We start with the assumption they deserve us to make a very educated decision on best practice, best guess as to what is in their best interest. So the key really is good and thorough assessments Yes. of the child's individual needs and of the sibling dynamic and the nature the of the The dynamic, the history, uh, yeah. So how realistic it is yeah. for a healthy adoptive parent or two healthy adoptive parents, strong, supported, knowledgeable, will they be able to do it successfully? Because those sibling relationships are pathologized, aren't they, by Often. traumatic parenting? Often, right. And also, Traumatized at a very young age, often the siblings would be two, three, you know, one, mm -hmm. two, three years of age. And it's very primitive brain, fight or flight, mm -hmm. and they become trauma triggers for each other. Mm -hmm. And so it's, you can't, as you were saying earlier, it's not a cognitive resolution, let's all be happy and friendly with each mm -hmm. other. It's a much more profound and primitive mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. disturbance, really, mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. that sibling relationship. Mm -hmm. It really is. And they do reenact with each other, they do trigger each other. Sometimes they were forced to abuse each other. Yeah. Uh, sometimes one was uh, really had to be a, a servant or a parent, a four year old had to parent the three year old, and now the four year old can't stop doing it and can't focus on self, and it's just really confused. Um, 
sometimes it, in the theory that they should stay together could be so damaging to these kids if because of that they can't have a solid stable placement. Uh, one of the uh, one example years ago I was asked to, to consult and about what to do. These kids have been in three failed adoptions. Two kids, three failed adoptions. The boy was horrific behaviors. The girl a lot of internalized problems, a lot of anxiety, sad, sometimes uh, almost suicidal even though she was like seven. Real young kid but really had a hard time. Well, what I realized was, when I was looking at the reports and all, after the first one, after the second one, and now after the third one, she's crying. I don't want to live with my brother. Please give him my own family. And it was disregarded those first two times. Right. She had to go live with her brother, and then they couldn't make it, so they both were removed, and now she had to start over again. Yeah. I felt so sad for that yeah. little girl. She knew. She knew she couldn't have parents as long as she was with her brother. Yeah. But the theory said, ignore the girl. So we really have to set that aside and say, we don't know, but we have to respect that it may be more likely than not that this, if they've got two really damaged kids, that they're not going to be able to live together. But they can have contact, yes. successful contact. And if they can have good contact during their childhood and adolescence, if they're doing reasonably well, because they have a good homes, they settled in, they're now attached, They'll have great relationships when they're adults. Yes. Great. That's very helpful. Thank you.